It is the eighth month of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Much has happened on the battlefield and the diplomatic front in the first half of October, but unfortunately we're no closer to the end of this war. Ukraine continues its liberation efforts, while Russia has started sending its first mobilized troops into the battlefield. Stakes are getting higher, and the situation is escalating with the nuclear threat looming in the background. Welcome to our video on the events of the Russo-Ukrainian War that took place in the first half of October. In our previous video, we described the Ukrainian advance east of the river Oskil. On October 1st, the Ukrainian army reached one of the main targets of its operations in northern Donbass by liberating Liman, as the 81st Emobil Brigade, elements of the National Guard, and the Klyuchevsky Battalion entered the city. Russia also lost Yampil, Stavky, Zarichna, Torska, and several other settlements in this direction. At this point, the objective of the Russian command was to establish a relatively stable defensive line from Svatova to Kremina. The loss of Svatova would mean the loss of a critical logistical line in North Donbass, and the liberation of Kremina would increase the threat on the severodonetsk lysychansk agglomeration, which Russia lost many men and equipment capturing. Russia retaliated for its losses with a missile strike on Kharkiv, which took the lives of 24 people. Russian setbacks in September have caused significant discontent in the elite as well. The Chechen leader, Ramzan Kedirov, heavily criticized the commander of the Central Military District, General Lapin, for the Russian losses on this front, and accused the Chief of Staff, General Valery Gerasimov, of protecting Lapin. The oligarch and owner of the Wagner Group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, supported Kedirov. Both Prigozhin and Kedirov have armed groups, and they have been among the most vocal supporters of the invasion, and consistently urged Putin to escalate in Ukraine. It seems like there is some fight for power and status between the Ministry of Defense on one side and Kedirov and Prigozhin on the other. On October 7th, the Washington Post published a story claiming that a member of Putin's inner circle criticized him personally for military setbacks in Ukraine. Around the same time, Several Russian military bloggers theorized that cracks were forming in the Russian elite as pro-war and pro-peace groups developed in the Kremlin. Prigozhin and Kedirov are prominent members of the pro-war faction who intend to discredit the Russian military command and strengthen their political positions through their actions in Ukraine. The pro-peace group consists of Russian officials who want a negotiated settlement with the West to avoid losing their assets and links with the West. We don't have sufficient information about internal processes in the Russian elite. Still, it is noteworthy that following Kedirov's and Prigozhin's criticism, drastic changes were made in command of the Russian occupation force in Ukraine. In early October, it was reported that Lieutenant General Roman Berzhnikov replaced Colonel General Alexander Zhiravlev as the commander of the Western Military District, while Lieutenant General Rustam Muridov became the commander of the Eastern Military District instead of Colonel General Alexander Chaiko. Interestingly, Lapin has not been replaced, despite heavy criticism, as it seems like Putin does not want to acquiesce to the public demands of one of the factions, as balancing these factions has been one of the key factors behind his long reign. Putin cannot afford to look weak at this point. Still, Putin's promotion of Kedirov to General Colonel, the second such promotion since the beginning of the war, created some discomfort among the nationalist groups, worried that the Chechen leader was gaining even more prominence. At the same time, Putin also understood the gravity of his military situation in Ukraine and changed the overall commander of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. General Sergei Sarovikin, known for his brutal targeting of civilians in Syria, was appointed to this position on October 8th. Very soon, he started implementing his usual tactics in Ukraine, and we'll talk about it in a bit. But for now, let's go back to describing the developments on the North Donbass front. Following the liberation of Liman, the Russian withdrawal along the front continued. In the south of the front, the 81st Airmobile Brigade and the 95th Air Assault Brigade pressed the Russian army units, which had earlier retreated from Liman, namely elements of the 144th Guards Motor Rifle Division, the remnants of the battered 201st Military Base, and the Bars 13 and 16 Volunteer Units further towards the outskirts of Kremina. Also on October 2nd, the 71st Separate Jäger Brigade pushed back the 61st Naval Infantry Brigade of the Russian Army from Nevske, while the 66th Separate Mechanized Brigade liberated Terny. 
by October 3rd, Russian telegram channels claimed the Ukrainian forward units had been able to reach the P-66 highway around Kremina, which threatened the Russian units in Svatovo, Rabishna, and consequently in the severodonetsk lysychansk agglomeration. Along with that, Nizhya Solona, Pitliman, Nizhnya Zhirevka, Borova, Shikivka, Bohislavka, and Borivska Andrivka on the eastern bank of the Oskil were liberated by the 80th Air Assault Brigade and the 92nd Mechanized Brigade, as the Russian army in this area retreated to the east bank of the river Zherebets to create a new defensive line between Svatova and Kremina. On October 5th, the 71st Brigade continued its advance with the liberation of Rakivka and Makivka villages of the Luhansk Oblast, as the 61st Naval Infantry Brigade retreated towards the Russian defensive line around the P-66 highway. In the next few days, Ukrainian forces liberated Shlushkivka, Stelmikivka, Novolubivka, Novoyahorivka, Berestova, Hishchena, Krokomalna, Kislivka, and Kotolyarivka, as the Russian army continued retreating to their defensive line to presumably make a stand there. Reports of the newly mobilized Russian troops arriving at the new Russian defensive line between Svatova and Kremina emerged on October 11th. Mixed information about Russian attempts to push back the 81st Airmobile Brigade and the 95th Air Assault Brigade from the outskirts of Kremina towards Zarishna and Torska have been refuted by Ukrainian military bloggers, as the Russian counteroffensive launched on October 11th failed. Nevertheless, the arrival of Mobiks, as Russians call mobilized soldiers, may have pushed the Russian command to attempt to reverse the momentum on this front. Surely mobilized Russian soldiers are untrained, or extremely poorly trained, but the early indications demonstrate that Russia intends to send the bulk of its new conscripts to the North Luhansk front line to stabilize it, and the sheer quantity of Russian troops in this area can potentially slow down the Ukrainian advance. As of October 16th, Ukraine has been advancing towards Svatova from three directions. The Ukrainian command intends to capture this town before the number of mobilized troops becomes a problem. For now, Mobiks and the remnants of the Russian army routed in the Kharkiv Oblast are the best hope for Russia to prevent the Ukrainian advance on Svatova and eventually Starobilsk, which, as we noted before, are critical logistical hubs for the Russian military presence in North Donbass. Losing them would mean that Russia would have to supply its troops in Donbass via a much longer route, from the M04 and E40 highways and railroads along them, which would only exacerbate the Russian supply problem, which could potentially become a heavy blow for the whole Russian occupation campaign in Ukraine by becoming a massive problem for the Russian group in the severodonetsk lysychansk agglomeration, putting Russian control over vast lands north of the city of Luhansk under serious threat. We must mention that both the Wagner mercenaries and LDNR separatists started constructing a line of World War-style trenches in the Hiska Zolota area, which is currently 20 kilometers from the front. This raised some eyebrows, as this is the only general area where Russian forces have any momentum, and the Ukrainian advance is happening elsewhere. The Russians also experienced severe problems on the Hirsan front, where the battles intensified. On October 2nd, Ukraine breached Russian lines along the right bank of the river Dnipro and forced them to retreat up to 30 kilometers south. The Ukrainian 60th Brigade capitalized on the fact that the Russian 98th Guards Airborne Division was pulled out for rotation and cut through the understaffed 80th Motor Rifle Brigade. As a result, within a day, Ukrainian forces, reportedly spearheaded by 17 tanks and 11 infantry fighting vehicles, managed to advance for almost 30 kilometers from Zolotobelka to Datcheny as the Russians hastily retreated. To the west of Datcheny, Kreshchenivka, Shevchenivka, and Lyubimivka were also liberated. This attack aimed to reach Novokokovka and the P-47 highway to divide the remaining Russian forces on the right bank of the Dnipro. The 35th and the 36th Naval Infantry Brigades of Ukraine were not able to achieve similar success around Devidiv Brid initially, but they finally managed to defeat the Russian units in the area, as on October 4th, Ukraine broke through the Russian defenses in Davidiv Brid, liberating this long-contested Russian stronghold in the area, along with Velika Oleksandrivka and Mala Oleksandrivka. The Russian retreat along the Dnipro continued, as they blew a road bridge in the area to delay the Ukrainian advance. The long front line in the Hesson Oblast, sparsely manned by the Russian units, was tough to defend for the Russian army, suffering from diminishing manpower, and as their defenses had been breached, they decided to drop back and establish a narrower front line, 
roughly going along Brzeznica, Borazenska, Milovo. The liberation of Dutcheny means that Tapinka, which Russia used extensively as an airbase and logistical hub, is now in range of the HIMARS missiles. Russian defenses in North Luhansk and Kherson Oblast had to rely on establishing strongholds in towns and villages, since Russia simply did not have enough men to defend the whole front line properly. Such strongholds are vulnerable to flanking and attacks from the rear, which the Ukrainian army took advantage of. Some Ukrainian commentators have criticized the Ukrainian command for not pursuing the routed Russian units, and hence deepening their advance, as instead they preferred to mop up villages and settlements on the way to prevent any surprises. The Ukrainian leadership probably chose this tactic not to overextend its supply lines, but this has allowed the Russian army to build some defensive fortifications on their next line of defense. There are reports of the construction of fortifications in the city of Kherson and Vesela. These fortifications cover a small area, and it looks like their purpose is to buy just enough time for the orderly retreat of the Russian units from the western bank of the Dnipro, if holding it becomes too costly. On October 9th and 14th, Russia attempted to counterattack Tenovipodi, Novokamyanka, and Sukhistavok, but this attempt was repulsed. It is reported that another common destination of mobilized Russian soldiers is the Hessan Front. Putin wants to hold the right bank of the Dnipro, particularly after annexing Hessan Oblast, even though he's not sure where the borders of his annexed territories are, according to his spokesman Dmitry Peskov. Military commentators predict that Russia will have to withdraw to the eastern bank of the Dnipro in the foreseeable future. At some point, the Ukrainian pressure, accompanied by the Russian inability to adequately supply its troops against the background of ever-present HIMAR strikes on pontoon bridges and crossings on the river Dnipro, will force them to make this tough and unpopular decision. It is claimed that Putin ordered his commanders not to retreat on the Kherson front. On October 8th, a huge symbolic, strategic and operational event occurred. A major explosion significantly damaged the Kerch Strait Bridge, linking Russia with occupied Crimea. This bridge, consisting of a highway and a railroad, completed in 2019, is a project considered very personal for Putin and has a symbolic meaning in terms of his perception of himself as a unifier of the Russian lands. The bridge was a statement project, conveying the message that Russia is now forever linked with Crimea. The Kerch Bridge allowed Russia to establish a land link with the illegally occupied peninsula, enabling the Russian army to supply its units on the southern front. This explosion destroyed one lane of the road bridge and damaged the railroad track. Russia immediately started repairing the bridge, which is already open for passenger rail and light road traffic. However, it looks like the bridge is still too damaged for the movement of heavily armored vehicles and rail freight transport, which exacerbates the supply issues of the southern front. There is another railway and highway connecting Russia to the occupied Hessen Oblast, but the Militopol Tokmak railway is too close to the Zaporizhian front, and the road connecting Mariupol to Hessen is of lower quality. The damage to the Kerch Bridge will likely cause delays in Russian logistics as the government intends to complete the repairs by July 2023. There have been different explanations for this explosion. The most common version, corroborated by footage of the incident, is that a truck carrying explosives exploded on the bridge and caused the explosion of seven fuel tanks moving on the railroad at this point. Unmanned kamikaze boats and missile strikes are among other versions. Whatever the cause, the blast was received very differently by either side. Ukraine did not officially claim responsibility, but some officials openly celebrated the damage to the Kerch Bridge. Some have speculated that the explosion was caused by internal fighting in the Kremlin, possibly to sow more seeds of suspicion within Russian ranks. The Russian reaction was disbelief and anger. After all, the Kremlin guaranteed the security of the bridge on numerous occasions, but failed to protect it from what looks like an ingenious operation of Ukrainian intelligence. At first, Russia did not officially blame Ukraine and opened an investigation, which predictably concluded that Ukraine was behind this attack. It is essential to mention that the commentators claiming that Ukraine committed a terror attack are wrong. The bridge was used for military logistics, and as such was a valid military target, even though civilian casualties occurred. Russia retaliated with a series of strikes on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, lasting several days. 
it was arguably the biggest such attack since the early days of the war. On October 9th to 11th, six missiles hit several apartment blocks in Zaporizhia, killing dozens. This was followed by an airstrike on targets in 16 different cities in Ukraine. Russia launched 83 missiles and 24 drones, according to Ukrainian command. Ukraine managed to shoot down 43 missiles and 13 drones. But Russia still inflicted significant damage on Ukrainian infrastructure in Kyiv, Kharkiv, Dnipro, Lviv, Ternopil, Zhotomir, Kremenchuk, and other cities. At least 11 civilians were killed in this attack, which seemingly had little to no military significance as Russia wasted its limited precision missile and drone stockpiles to damage Ukrainian energy and heating infrastructure, parks, playgrounds, residential buildings, a German consulate, and the pedestrian Klitschko Bridge in Kyiv. For several days, Russia continued its airstrikes, using Kh-101 and Kh-55 Iskander missiles and Shahed-136 drones supplied by Iran. These retaliatory airstrikes aimed to break the resolve of the Ukrainian people to fight, damage their morale, and cause problems with power and heating for ordinary Ukrainians. Sarovikin, notorious for destroying Aleppo in the Syrian war, was putting his stamp on the Russian invasion using similar tactics. But this was an ineffective use of precision missiles. There is no indication that these airstrikes have broken the Ukrainian will to fight. On the contrary, it has made them angrier. Ukraine has responded by striking the energy infrastructure of Belgorod, along with targeting Russian ammunition depots stationed in the region. The Russian reserves of precious precision missiles have further decreased. According to the Ukrainian defense minister, Alexei Reznikov, Russia has used 1,235 out of 1,844 Iskander, Caliber, and air-launched cruise missiles since the start of the war. Production of such missiles takes time, and sanctions imposed on Russia may impact further production. Moreover, this attack has prompted the Western coalition to provide more air defense systems to Ukraine. Germany delivered Iris-T air defense systems, Spain pledged four Hawk air defense systems, the United States decided to expedite the delivery of the NASAMS air defense systems, France promised to provide Krotal short-range anti-air missiles, while the United Kingdom agreed to donate AMRAAMS missiles compatible with NASAMS, while NATO is going to provide 100 drone jamming stations to counter the Iranian drones. The Russian mobilization, the declared annexation of the occupied Ukrainian lands, and the brutal attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure have pushed the West to provide more military support throughout the first half of October. The United States pledged 155mm and 105mm howitzers, Excalibur precision-guided artillery shells and other artillery shells, HIMARS and HARM missiles, more armored vehicles, Claymore mines, anti-tank weapons, and so on. Canada promised to deliver winter uniforms, drones, and satellite services. The United Kingdom will provide 18 more howitzers and aerial drones. Germany agreed to send more Panzerhubitzer 2000 howitzers and Mars 2 MLRS. The West managed to maintain a steady supply of weapons to Ukraine in October too. There are fears that this arms support will diminish the Western weapon reserves, but for now the support is strong and there's no indication that it will decrease. Interesting developments occurred in Belarus, a staging point for the initial Russian attack on Kyiv in February, also used for the missile strikes. It has been relatively less involved since the early days of the invasion, but throughout the war, rumors have been circulated about the impending deployment of the Belarusian army against Ukraine. So far, this has not happened, even though it has been reported that Putin has been pushing Lukashenko to send in his troops. But this might be changing. On October 8th, Belarus officially accused Ukraine of preparing to attack its territory. On October 10th, it was reported that Belarus sent several dozens of its T-72A tanks to Russia. Moreover, Lukashenko announced the deployment of the Union State's regional grouping of forces. Currently, it seems that only 9,000 Russian soldiers will be in this regional grouping, mainly consisting of the First Guards tank army and several airborne units, which have suffered heavy losses. Ukrainians claim that Belarus is preparing to host 20,000 mobilized Russians within the framework of the IGF. This may allow these men to be trained appropriately and to fix a considerable amount of Ukrainian forces near Kyiv to be ready for any incursions from the northern borders of Ukraine. 
The fact that Belarus is sending tanks and military equipment to Russia, instead of stationing it on the border with Ukraine, indicates that at this point, Russia and Belarus do not plan to attack Ukraine from the northwest. On October 14th, Lukashenko proclaimed a counter-terrorism operation regime in Belarus, without explaining what it meant. It looks like Belarus is trying to appease Russia by giving it tanks and weapons and fixing some Ukrainian forces in the region with its posturing. We also have reports that some Shahed drones will be stationed in the Belarusian Leninets Air Base, creating a new vector of aerial threat for Kyiv. It is difficult to say if this was another attempt to put pressure on Ukraine, or a symptom of a future escalation, or just the routine governmental procedure, but some countries diplomatically close to Russia, including China, asked their citizens to leave Ukraine. This gives us a good segue to talk about diplomatic events. The UN vote to condemn Russia's illegal annexation of Ukrainian territory passed with 143 countries in favor, and only five – Russia, Belarus, North Korea, Nicaragua and Syria – against. Rumors that Zelensky and Putin might negotiate during the G20 summit in Indonesia were circulated. Turkey announced its commitment to facilitate the talks between the two countries. Armenia and Azerbaijan have seemingly taken steps towards a peace treaty, and they managed to do it without Russian participation in the process, showing how the situation changed in the region Russia considered its backyard. Simultaneously, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries decided to decrease oil production amid the price drop of the commodity. We also learned that the US has intensified negotiations with Venezuela to normalize relations and get more of the Venezuelan oil to the international markets to keep prices stable. China's lukewarm support of Russia continued, but their officials also stated that any nuclear escalation is unacceptable. Not much changed on the Zaporizhia and Donbass fronts. In Zaporizhia, sides continued artillery battles without any significant movement. In Donbass, Russia went on with its frontal assaults on Bakhmut and Solidar. Reports of attacks by the Wagner and DPR units on this line emerged on October 3rd, 4th, 5th, 7th, 9th, 10th, 13th and 14th. The 93rd Mechanized Brigade continued its defense against Russian attacks, which were heavily taxing for both sides. For the first time in a while, Russia managed some advances by occupying Mykolaivka Druha, Zaitseva and Vesela Delina. The DPR separatist forces claimed they took control of both Opitna, which the Ukrainians have denied, and Ivanhered. It is an interesting wrinkle that Prigozhin denied the DPR claim, stating that battles near Ivanhered were going on, while the Wagner group captured Opitna single-handedly. In the first half of October, Ukraine maintained its momentum by advancing on two different fronts. Russia is hastily sending in Mobix to bolster its thinly manned defensive lines. However, the conduct of mobilization continued to be criticized in Russia. Putin stated that the Ministry of Defense did not make timely changes to the legal framework on the list of those who are not subject to mobilization. Adjustments have to be made. While the chairperson of the Russian State Duma Defense Committee, Andrei Kotopolov, called upon the Russian Ministry of Defense to stop lying. It is quite a heavy accusation, showing the Russian elite's frustration. But the problems with the Russian mobilization are so evident that even Russian officials cannot help but criticize it. For instance, on October 15th, the Russian Defense Ministry stated that 11 conscripts were shot dead and 15 were injured on a military firing range by two of their fellow soldiers, possibly on religious grounds. Russia continued its efforts to recruit inmates. According to the Russian human rights organization Sitting Russia, Sitting is a slang term for spending time in prison, Gulagu.net and the Foundation for the Rights of Inmates, at least 15,130 inmates have been deployed in Ukraine. 700,000 Russians have already fled their country since mobilization was declared, according to Forbes's Russia report of October 4th. Other reports claim that the number is higher than 1 million at this point. Russia may claim that the mobilization is partial, but the events on the ground show that it will continue indefinitely. Training, supply and command of the Mobix remained a big problem for the Russian army. Tens of thousands are already on the front lines with no training, hundreds dead or captured. The United States continued asserting that there are no indications of Russia preparing for a nuclear strike, but the tension is still there. 
This tension presumably pushed Elon Musk to suggest his peace proposal, which asks Ukraine to accept the annexation of Crimea by Russia and hold referendums in four occupied oblasts of Ukraine supervised by international monitors. This caused an angry response from many Ukrainian officials. The American political scientist Ian Bremer accused Musk of making this suggestion after talking to Putin, which Musk vehemently denied. This story developed with reports of SpaceX asking the Pentagon to pay for the use of Starlink in Ukraine. But whether it was due to the reports of the federal investigation of Musk's attempted controversial Twitter purchase or some other reasons, on October 15th, Elon Musk made a U-turn and agreed to continue supporting Ukraine with Starlink. It is good news for Ukraine, as Starlink is a crucial component of the communication system of the Ukrainian army. Now let's talk about the losses the sides have endured. There were no recent credible reports on the Ukrainian manpower losses, but according to the October 12th report of the independent Russian media outlet Medusa, 90,000 Russian troops have been killed, disabled or gone missing since the start of the war. Medusa's report is claimed to be based on an FSB source. By October 16th, the visually confirmed losses of the sides, according to the Oryx blog, are as follows. For Russia, they are 1,342 tanks, 2,773 vehicles, 169 command posts and communication stations, 23 heavy mortars, 414 artillery pieces and vehicles, 137 multiple rocket launches, 62 aircraft, 53 helicopters, and 138 drones. On the Ukrainian side, the visually confirmed equipment losses are the following. 298 tanks, 778 vehicles, 7 command posts and communication stations, 127 artillery pieces and vehicles, 25 multiple rocket launches, 52 aircraft, 15 helicopters, and 38 drones. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.